when I think about like the, the greatest cultural and social and economic revolutions of modern history from, you know, the French revolution to, you know, the, the, the protests in the sixties against the war, it's not, you know, the, the conversations that people had on the news or the books about these things that people remember. It's the art. It's the culture that comes out of these monumental events. It's the war songs that connect with people that are what we remember 50, 100, 1,000 years from these events happening. The way that people have talked about Bitcoin is finally at this point where the artists now start to get it a little bit and they're able to communicate through whatever their art form is to teach people and the world about Bitcoin. And I think that's magical. Julian, I'm glad you were uh, able to make it back from your uh, travels across El Salvador so we could do a little session here. Thanks for having me. How was it? Oh, beautiful. We did uh, Ruta de las Flores. So nice. So this is my second time here. The first time it was just San Salvador, El Tunco, El Zante, all three really nice places. But to see the mountainside, it's like a completely different side of El Salvador. And that was just amazing. Really beautiful. The towns. weather is perfect, huh? I know. On top of the mountains there at <laughs> night. Yeah, <laughs> go out. I mean, I love the beach, but but when you get to that high altitude, it's like between, you know, 60 and 80 degrees all the time, you know, between night and day. And so it never gets too hot, never gets too cold. Mm -hmm. It's like perfect. Yeah, no, it's it's a beaut up there. And then like the artwork in the towns. I've, you know, I've, I've driven around a lot of places in Peru and, and you have those vibes a little bit when you get to Cusco. Cusco, I think, is quite a bit higher up, but... You get those artisanal vibes. And I think that section of El Salvador, I think once the expats find that, oh boy, that'll be the next uh, big circular economy. They're kind of doing it already with Berlin, right? Like yeah. that's sort of in the mountains too, right? Yeah, it's not on, I don't think it's technically on the Ruta de las Flores, but it's a similar like environment. It's up in coffee country, high, higher altitude, has a better weather. Yeah, so. yeah. Did you do any coffee tasting or tours or anything like that? Or what did, what did you guys do? It's weird. I used to never be into coffee and it didn't start really until this year. And now I'm having it all the time. Um, so I didn't think about doing that. I'm not a coffee snob yet. So for me, you know, whatever they're serving at the restaurant or the cafe is good enough for me. Um, but it's interesting to seeing all the art. And then we saw like the size of some of these mountains and they're crisscrossed like tic-tac-toe boards almost. And I imagine that has something to do with the coffee. Yeah, so they plant uh, trees as like windbreaks. They have like a certain type of tree that they plant in those designs to break the wind mm -hmm. so it doesn't damage the, I'm assuming, knock the beans off the, the plants or the flowers off the plants. So, but it, it makes it look really cool. It looks, it. Yeah, yeah, it looks like, uh, it looks like alien work almost. Yeah. It's really neat. I imagine you can get really creative with that stuff too. You don't have to just do it in crisscross. You can do a whole bunch of different designs with that, so. It's really beautiful from the cars, like seeing that as you kind of go down the, the winding roads there. So what was on your agenda this time here in El Salvador? Were you filming at all or what, were you just here for the conference? I, it's funny, I actually didn't film almost anything except just stuff from my Instagram, uh, just for my story. I didn't make like a movie or anything. Um, so I came down for adopting Bitcoin. Um, it's my second time down here, I came I believe it was December 2021. So it was like three months after the Bitcoin law had been in place. And I did a little documentary for my YouTube channel on it. And uh, that was the first time I'd ever done a film about Bitcoin from like a documentary standpoint, because the other ones I had done were just in my office doing like little, it's the things that you record in front of your computer. And I thought, okay, I have some, you know, we were all feeling pretty rich back then, I guess in, in 21. <laughs> so I, I sold some of my Bitcoin. Came to El Salvador with my girlfriend for two weeks and uh, we connected with some journalists and we did all these interviews with people and uh, met some local entrepreneurs and we went, you know, obviously to El Zante and El Tunco and just tried to do kind of like a, uh, you know, a, a first perspective of what the Bitcoin law could bring to the country. And uh, it was right around the time actually that I believe was the Latin American Bitcoin conference was in town. 
Yes, they had the Libbit Comp that Libbit year Comp, too. The yeah. first, yeah, the first, the first. It was, it was the first conferences after the the law was passed. They had adopting Bitcoin and Libbit Comp. Yeah, they were both. back to back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my first Bitcoin conference ever. So that was. Oh fun. really? Yeah. Yeah, it was first time I, I'd done Bitcoin meetups in the past, but you know they were very small. So that was actually my first time going to a place where I could spend Bitcoin and meeting other Bitcoiners. And I always like I love to look at um, all this stuff through the lens of my girlfriend because you know what it's like when you have partners or friends like you're just talking about Bitcoin with them all the time. But to bring them to be a part of this, and then this time around in 2023, I brought my dad with me, so he got to experience all of this stuff too for the first time. Spending Bitcoin, I loaded up one of his Lightning wallets. He's, I think he's made like three or four transactions with it. He got to meet all of us uh, psychopaths. Was, was he a, a Bitcoiner before he came? He's becoming one. It's taken a while, you know. Um, he, you know, he was around in the '60s, um, you know, when they had like the Vietnam draft and all that stuff. And he sees a lot of parallels between what we're doing trying to create this kind of new world and you know what he was going through back in the, the days of the hippies back then. Um, and I would say before he came down here, I'd say he was about 70% orange pilled. And I think it's, I, I would say I'll speak on his behalf. I think it's closer to 90% now. Um, actually getting to use it and to meet all these, you know, wonderful people that make up our community here. Um, I don't know what the last 10% is, uh, but yeah, I think you always have to use it a little bit to understand and appreciate it. So I'm glad that he was able to, you know, be a part of that. And he's he's tagging along with me. I'm going to Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, and then in two weeks uh, we're going to Peru. We'll, we'll get to that. But just a a Bitcoin month ahead. <laughs> so, what is your Bitcoin story? Like, how did you come into Bitcoin? And now is that is that all you're doing? Is Bitcoin related film work or? Is that a side thing or is that your main thing or give us it, a little backstory? It's becoming my main thing. Um, all right. I'll give you the full story here. Give me one second. Okay. So my Bitcoin journey started around, I think it was late. Actually, I, I like to skip and say my Bitcoin journey sort of technically started in 2012. I bought Bitcoin in order to buy things that were not legal in my country at the time. So to me, I was like, okay, I need to buy these things from a particular website that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I need Bitcoin to do it. Let's figure out how to get that and then get my thing. Didn't care, didn't touch it for four years after that point. It started showing up on my radar in 2016. And I think that was around the time that Ethereum was starting out as well. And um, I was just about to graduate um, university. I went to school for a degree in film production. Um, wanted to get into, you know, directing movies, editing, all that sort of stuff. And I had about 3000 bucks left in student loans. And I put it basically all in a split between Bitcoin, Ethereum and Canadian marijuana stocks. Because uh, I was just like, what can I, you know, as a young kid, I was like, what can I put in that will go up the fastest? And if it goes to zero, it's 3000 bucks, right? So I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, ended up getting really first into crypto because I caught the Ethereum thing really early on. Um, and the reason I got into Ethereum is because I used Bitcoin, but then someone just pitched Ethereum to me. It's like, oh, it's Bitcoin, but you can program it and stuff. And literally six days after I bought my first Ethereum uh, or Ether, the DAO hack happened, if you remember that, where they had to fork Ethereum because some hacker made away with 20% of it from some, some smart contract. And that taught me a lesson very quickly about immutability. And then the following months, I lived through, I guess, like another version of the block size wars when, when Bitcoin forked from Bitcoin Cash. And so I learned a lot about, you know, block size and why that stuff's important. But for probably like three years, I only looked at it as like a speculative investment. And when I pitched it to my friends and family, it was, you know, oh, this is the future of money. Um, you know, there's only 21 million, kind of like the basic level stuff. Um, and it really wasn't until the pandemic, and you probably heard this line, you know, tons of times, that I really started to think about what is money, that, you know, eternal question um, around the same time that Sailor did, and he was coming out in all these podcasts. And it really was him and a few other Bitcoiners that were really public at the time, kind of asking these deeper questions amidst all the stimulus that got me really engaged into thinking, you know, what if Bitcoin is more than just this investable asset class? And what if there's something much bigger here 
like a cultural movement or a social movement or something that really stuck out to me as someone who's sort of like, I guess like an ideologue. I, I used to be really into American politics and I still to this day, I watch all the Democratic Republican debates. It's sort of like my version of football. Um, and I was like, he, well, they've been pretty weak lately. So. Yeah, they've been pretty awful. Well, they're missing Trump, right? Yeah. He's the, he's a big <laughs> one. But yeah, like I, I've, you know, when I was in high school, I, I was really into the Occupy Wall Street protests. Like I've always just felt that something was broken in the system. And I never really thought about the connection to the monetary layer itself and how that's used and manipulated by a counterfeit class of, of you know, central bankers and people deep within the government. And um, I, I knew about Bitcoin for so long before I made that connection. And it really did take Michael Saylor and a few other podcasts to really make it click in my head. And then I realized after just- Even though you had purchased it. I had owned it. And I just thought it before. was, I just thought of it like a stock or an asset. Yeah. You know, I just didn't think it was that powerful. I just thought it was a cool piece of tech and I was early to it. Um, and yeah, it was through these podcasts and through reading all these books, you know, we, we all put in the thousands of hours. And then you just start seeing all the things that the, the Bitcoiners on the ground are doing, like what you were doing and what you're still doing and what all these other Bitcoiners around the world are doing with the circular economies, with the products, um, with the books, with, with the merchandise, with the conferences. And I think like every Bitcoiner, you sort of want to find what your, what your part to play in all of this is. And for me, I've just always been into storytelling. And so for a while, I you know, just tried my hand at YouTube tutorials, um, teaching people 101 Bitcoin concepts, and then diving a little bit deeper into more general finance topics. But then I realized all the, all the hundreds and thousands of hours that I put into Bitcoin, um, I couldn't find the stuff that I actually like to watch myself, which is I love watching people go on adventures on you know YouTube to different countries and to learn things about different cultures. I'm a huge fan of Yes Theory, you know National Geographic, um, these really like stylish filmmakers and storytellers who take you to places in untraditional ways and, and become part of the story themselves as also the filmmakers. And I wasn't seeing anyone make this in the Bitcoin space. There've always been Bitcoin documentaries, but they've, they're told very much in like an omniscient perspective. You have a narrator, you have these nice sit down interviews. And I wasn't finding the stuff that I liked, which was more casual. And then also in 21 and 22, like the advent of, of TikTok just blowing up and that being the way that people were watching and learning about things, there were hardly any Bitcoiners reaching out to that demographic as well. And so the last two years have been kind of, just me playing around with different formats from 60 second shorts to travel documentaries, um, trying to make the type of stuff that I wish I had seen uh, to learn about Bitcoin so that I didn't have to put in maybe a hundred or a thousand hours, but maybe I could do it in 10 or 15 or 20. And I could do it in a fun way, in a way that I could also share with my friends and family, because, you know, as much as we love podcasts, like it's hard to sit someone you love down and say, listen to this for three hours. It's going to change your world, <laughs> right? You have to do it piece, yeah. piecemeal. And that's why they do the clips for the podcast, right? But I just think like there's, 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 gotta, there's always got to be another way. That's what storytelling is all about. Well, I think the, yeah, seeing somebody using Bitcoin in this way you would never expect mm -hmm. grab somebody a lot more than, you know, people theorizing on why, you know, it's so important to have uncensorable money. Mm -hmm. And so I think that comes second, you know, first, first you got to have your attention grabbed and then you get, you know, once you get sucked down the rabbit hole, you care about those other things, but it usually doesn't start that way. No, no. And I think, I think another thing too, is that I, I always try and ask people around me who aren't fully orange pilled, like what's the hold up, right? And People don't want to admit it, but I did get a really honest admission from one of my friends. And it was that some of us come off as like very strong or daunting in the Bitcoin community. Either that we know everything and we know it with like extreme certainty. Um, or if, you know, you don't like it our way, then you can get out. I don't have time for you. And I mean, I get it a little bit because... You know, you can only have the same conversation so many times, but I think we vastly overestimate, um, you know, how much people actually know about Bitcoin. And I think we overestimate how hard it is for the average person who's working in nine to five 
to completely go down the rabbit hole and throw away everything that they think that they understood about the world and how it works. It's a really big ask of people. Um, and you have to be you have to be a very self-disciplined person, I find, to understand Bitcoin. You've got to be self-driven and, and able to teach yourself things. But not everyone in the world is going to be like that. And so I think there's so much more room for the ways that we teach it to people. Um, I think there are so many more voices that we need in the space. We need you know, more women, more people from other walks of life explaining it, people experimenting with different art forms to get the message across. And, and that's that's been my mission for the last like year is to basically try my own hand on it, but hopefully also elevate other people taking the creative risks to try and explain Bitcoin in their own language to other people. I think that to be able to have it told from different perspectives, because a lot of people, it's just they don't care about money per se or those things in general to them. It's just not that interesting to them. So for me, I was an economics major, like I, I love delving into that, but my wife's the complete opposite. I mean, she was a biology major. She could care less about money. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of things that, you know, I'm fascinated about Bitcoin to her. It's like, yeah, that's weird that you like that. But on the, by the same token, when she sees how people can use Bitcoin in real ways, people have been excluded from the banking system. And even for for her herself, as as you know, living here now, most of her purchases are made from Bitcoin. She gets that it's you know it's just a better way to do things, mm -hmm. but she still would not be interested in most of the sessions in the Bitcoin conference, those sort of things. So we need, we do need material that's very different than what you're going to have at conferences mm -hmm. that just shows everyday life and why people should care. Because for a lot of them, they're like. Yeah, that's fine. You're into it, but what, what do I care? Mm -hmm. And so they have to really understand, no, your life is really is impacted by money. Even if you don't think about it, it determines the majority of what you do on a, you know, and your day to day life. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think the storytelling comes in. And I think one of the one of the big challenges with with Bitcoin, too, is like it is this esoteric concept. So naturally, people are going to gravitate towards trying to ground it in written texts or just a conversation between two people. But to me, I, I see that as like, that's, that's how it has to start, but that's not where it ends. And, you know, when I think about like the, the greatest cultural and social and economic revolutions of modern history from, you know, the French revolution to, you know, the, the, the protests in the sixties against the war, it's not, you know, the, the conversations that people had on the news or the books about these things that people remember. It's the art. It's the culture that comes out of these monumental events. It's the war songs that connect with people that are what we remember 50, 100, 1,000 years from these events happening. And I think Bitcoin is finally mature enough uh, or the way that people have talked about Bitcoin is finally at this point where the artists now start to get it a little bit and they're able to communicate through whatever their art form is to teach people and the world about Bitcoin. And I think that's magical. Um, the biggest challenge is just figuring out, you know, how do we support all these artists creating this stuff in a world that doesn't really look at art as that useful, I think, anymore. Um, he looks at it very utilitarian. I, I'm, I'm doing a documentary on a guy um, named Madex, and he does these, you know, really in-depth paintings and portraits and, and cool merchandise that are almost like testaments to freedom, the principles of freedom and Bitcoin. And, you know, we share exchanges all the time about how hard it is to get this into the hands of the right people and specifically engineers, because I think over the last few years, the world of the engineer and the world of the artist have completely divided. And artists and, and engineers, like the engineer is looked at as just this utility to make structures and buildings and new creations happen. But it's really the artist that makes these things beautiful for an eternity, right? And um, I think that's the role that Bitcoiners are really gonna have moving forward is we have to make this beautiful. And when we make it beautiful, that's when we can hyper accelerate it to everyone else. Yeah, I think it is challenging. And I mean, it's it's always a challenge to, to figure out how to best support the arts. But I think in the Bitcoin space and, and not just with art, but with other things, including circular economy projects and other 
you know, nonprofit endeavors, um, Bitcoiners tend to want to hold on to their Bitcoin, yeah. even ones who who understand the importance of generosity and giving back their their view is I'm going to do that in the future when it's it's worth more. And mm -hmm. which is funny because it's worth more in fiat terms. It's still the same amount of Bitcoin. So if you're truly a, a Bitcoiner, then it, it shouldn't matter. But that's that's the you know the sense you know that's where they're coming from a lot of times and so mm. i try to push people you won't have this opportunity again like these opportunities that are passing to be part of this you can't get those back and so yes in dollar terms bitcoin might be worth more in the future but as far as how you can move the needle with how you're using your bitcoin i think you can actually be much more impactful with it by giving now so that's why I try to encourage people to be supporting the the people like you that are producing, you know, great works of art in the, the film space, but also the circular Bitcoin economies, you know, things like Bitcoin Akasi or Bitcoin Lake in Guatemala, where they're really having an impact on people at young people that I think 20 years from now will be the future leaders that are kind of driving this forward. And mm -hmm. if we don't invest in that now, it, it won't matter how much Bitcoin's worth in the future. We're missing that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think like I had a whole presentation on this. I think it requires a, a level of understanding and cooperation from all three parties, the, the creators themselves understanding that that's the opportunity. Um, the viewers understanding that, you know, their time is important and their voice also really makes a big difference on, on who gets seen and, you know, those like one or two connections you can get from just being a good viewer of something and sharing it with the right people. And then the companies themselves, right? You know, they have their own um, MOs for how they allocate capital. And they're, they've, are they you know, in, in the space of, let's just say, content creation, which is sort of what I'm in, you know, making videos, they play a much bigger role um, in terms of financing that stuff than usually individual donors. To me, what I wonder about is if that's going to change under a Bitcoin standard. I've had an immense amount of crowdfunding uh, relative to the size of my audience from Bitcoiners just, you know, sending me zaps on Noster or the Geyser Fund or, you know, I just put my lightning QR code at the end of videos. Another filmmaker uh, who does fantastic works, Max DeMarco, um, you know, he's, he's good enough to not take sponsorships and to not put ads on his videos. All his stuff is just financed by Bitcoiners, uh, you know, zapping. And I can't think of another community, um, you know, per thousand views that has as high of a donor count uh, than the Bitcoiners. So while it is hard to separate Bitcoiners from their Bitcoin, um, you need quite a few of them to do anything. I think the generosity uh, amongst Bitcoiners understanding the value of art and these important projects is pretty high. I don't think you're going to get the same follow through from you know, the Ethereum people or the Bitcoin cash people or whatever, right? Like they'll raise their money, but they're going to do it through other means, not straight from benevolence, you know? Yeah. Well, usually they have, you know, somebody who has ability to print whatever token it is mm -hmm. that that is willing to throw it their way because it doesn't matter to them. They just print more of it up. So exactly. <clears throat> yeah. So at this point, how do you finance these things? Like, what is the economic model for people like you that, and is this a side thing for you? Are you doing other film work outside of the Bitcoin space or is this all you're doing at this point? That's a good question. Um, so it's weird. I, I feel like in life generally, I'm a risk taker. I've been pretty conservative with my finances. And so I, I've done the YouTube thing kind of as like a hobby, you know, five to 20 hours a week for about three years. And it really wasn't until the last year that I said, this is going to become a 40, 50, 60 hour a week thing. Um, but before I did that, I sold what I needed to sell to have about a year of living expenses. I'm getting to the end of that runway. And I'm happy to say that I'm basically able to sustain myself through a myriad of things. And so like is that like yeah like how does that work is it is it easy to monetize youtube good question or yeah i'll, I'll try and break it down uh short of giving like a whole graph of it because i do like to be transparent about these things i think people need to understand you know how you actually do it um right now i'm working with two bitcoin companies producing content on their behalf as a host and those gigs are now coming in quite frequently I don't know if that's going to last forever. I know we're turning a new page with the, the price in the market, 
but I'm doing things right now where I will record video of myself, either doing a tutorial or, you know, doing street interviews and stuff like that. Just picking up odd jobs where I can, but keeping it just Bitcoin companies. And I have a team of editors right now that are turning all that stuff that I film uh, either myself or I get someone to film me, turning it into short videos. So I'm doing stuff for a couple different companies that's growing. Um, that's probably... And is that on YouTube or where do you... Or is that TikTok? That's where on... You... I don't know if I want to name the company specifically. I mean, you're, you're welcome to. Sure, show, sure. show them if they're, sure. if they're sponsoring I'll, I'll show you. Them. So. Yeah, okay. So, so free advertising. Uh, one is Bitcoin trading cards. Okay. Um, so I'm doing content for them. Uh, they make, I don't know if you've ever seen them. They do these really cool, you know, Pokemon. This from, they, they get their cards printed from the same company that prints the Pokemon cards. Okay. And they do these collectible cards. They have a whole bunch of uh, famous Bitcoiners on them, like Natalie Brunel is a card, okay. Max yeah, Kaiser is yeah. a card. They, they reached out to me and asked if they could do it. I don't know, it felt a little weird. I was like, oh, no, you got to do it. I oh, you like, blew it. You uh, missed it. You missed your chance. Oh. Well, no, you got you to push. <laughs> Their product is so cool. And the hardcore Bitcoiners, they love it. They have a whole telegram of these, these pack stackers, they call them. And they, their, their, their gimmick and the reason that the business model has worked so well for them is that they do these really limited supply runs of the cards. Like they'll make, you know, 2,121 packs for conferences. And it's just like, we're selling the model this conference. This is the last time you're ever going to get them. And I think that scarcity element, like all the Bitcoiners understand. So they have a really cool business model. They're doing all sorts of really creative things. They, they sponsored the, you know, the doc that I'm doing too, on top of me doing some stuff for them. Um, there's another company in Canada called Beaver Bitcoin. They do non-custodial Bitcoin buying. I'm doing street interview content. We're doing Bitcoin trivia at concert uh, at conferences. Um, just, you know, kind of the typical social media stuff, but more stuff that like Bitcoiners aren't doing. Yeah. Right. Like every other company in the tech space is doing, you know, paying a TikTok influencer to go out there and, and do that. But the Bitcoin companies are not quite there yet. So I'm doing a bit of stuff for them. Um, I'm doing some stuff for some hardware wallet, steel plate companies explaining their product and whatnot. So just is it yeah, is it easy gigs. for you to show them the return that they're getting or is that part of the, the challenge is well, they don't know what they're getting for what they're spending? They're taking a risk on me and they're doing this in lieu of having a full time marketing person because as a company, you want to be putting out content, showing your visibility and all that stuff. So you're either going to hire someone internally. Um, and there's some great examples. I, I know a lot, I know like everyone in the Bitcoin marketing space, great examples of this stuff working. And then other times where, you know, they don't quite have a grab on stuff, but it's easier for them to put money towards a creator. If there's a good price for it, um, to just make stuff on their behalf. And then they just send them the MP4s at yeah. the end of the day that they publish on their social media. So in terms of paid work, that's probably around the number one source right now I have. Um, and then breaking down the other things, I have done these mini documentaries. I've cranked out about four or five this year. Um, and I put my lightning QR code to a little, you know, plea saying I, I do fund it out of my own Bitcoin and, you know, whatever you can contribute, super appreciated. And, you know, this year I've gotten enough to basically break even on about three or four out of five of those documentaries. Really? Yeah. yeah. That's Impressive. That's better than I would have expected. I know, so. I know, I know. Like people have been very generous um, seeing the value of, I guess, the videos, which has been nice. Um, YouTube pays. And is it usually like a, a bunch of like small, you know, like oh, yeah. 10,000 sats? Or do you have people that are like, hey, here's, you know, 10 million sats? Well, <laughs> here's the thing. And I want to make a really big shout out to a couple of people. You've sent, you know, contributions to some of the films that I've done, which I've really appreciated. Um, BTC Sessions has been like a massive champion of mine. Uh, he's been sharing all of my stuff since like really in the early days. He's kicked into my crowdfunding things. He's, he's donated a lot because he's been on the same journey, right? Of yeah. Like basically building this Bitcoin thing out of nothing. Um, so he's been a great champion and I've had a lot of other and people. Are, are you Canadian? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you guys are both Canadians. Yeah. We too, got that so. going on. <laughs> the Canadian Bitcoiners, man, they're, they're something else. Like, yeah. We were talking about that with, with Francis. Uh, we did a recording last week and um, I, I was surprised to hear how much activity was going on and specifically in Quebec, like in Montreal early days. So do you want to know the average amount of people that came to our monthly Bitcoin meetups during the bear market this year or last year? Take a guess. Average amount per month. 
30? About 100, 120. Wow. Yeah. Mind you, you know, Greg Foss came to like two or three of them. Uh, Jeff Booth's come to a couple of them. We got some big wigs that are like in the area, so it draws a crowd. But even the ones that didn't have massive speakers, you know, we had a, a block party where we just had, we, we got a couple DJs and, and a couple, in Vancouver, we have 50 businesses that take Bitcoin. So we have our own little like somewhat, I wouldn't say it's circular, but we have an economy up there where you can spend Bitcoin. Um, we did a little block party on, I think it was Labor Day this year. We had about 220 people come to it. Most of them from Vancouver, some out of towners drove up from Seattle to come to it. So I couldn't, I couldn't explain to you what it is because if you look at Canadians as a whole, like most Canadian Bitcoiners do not have good things to say about, you know, the rest of Canada yeah. and the way that we vote. And I mean, well, that's what was surprised me when I was talking with yeah. Francis. Cause I was like, he was talking about how it was this libertarian group. And I was like, that does not sound like Canadians to me. Usually they're just kind of get along with everybody and don't want to make waves. And, you know, everything we saw with COVID, the way they just gave in to everything. So mm. yeah, it was kind of surprising. That that, everything. Yeah, 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 it was surprising it. to me that there, you know, was this this outlier group that was, you know, had that different view. It's weird. And I, I still can't, I can't concisely explain it, but I think a little bit of it has to do with when you grow up Canadian, you always know of someone or you know a story of someone who's just kind of like effed off to the woods, was never heard of again, lived a happy existence. And so if you have a little bit of capital and a bit of an adventurous spirit, I feel like Canada is the place to do that stuff. I feel like, you know, there are places in the U.S. you can just run to the forest and build a little homestead or whatever. But Canada has a lot more options for that. And it's becoming increasingly, you know, forced upon us because the, the housing costs are just ridiculous in Vancouver. So I've made a lot of friends and connections over just, um, you know, being a part of this homesteading community. And I've, I've met a lot of homesteaders and I, I have a home on an off-grid island that's not too close, like not too far away from Vancouver. And that's like my second passion when it's not Bitcoin, it's just sovereign living, like learning about agriculture, growing my own food, um, you know, learning about construction, elect, uh, you know, electrical work. And Is that your primary home? No, not yet. Okay. Coming together. I'm still renting in, in Vancouver because that's where all the action is. But eventually I will probably move away from the city and just be on the island there. Um, but I think there's sort of that uh, in Canada, you're able to just kind of peace out and live off the land. And you can do it, not every place in Canada, but there's a lot of beautiful places, you know, where you can you can dam a, a creek and, and create energy for yourself, move out. You know, we have this strip in, in British Columbia where it's, it's pretty much like a desert. So you could have pretty much year round solar there as well. Um, so there's a lot of options if you want to just get away from everything. And I think that brings some of the Canadian Bitcoiners together. And that's why some of them don't want to leave. Um, now, a few of them have. Like, I think you had Francis on the show and he's down in Costa Rica now. But there's a ton of Bitcoiners moving here to El Salvador. Exactly, and, that too. And the type that, I mean, some of them have never traveled before in their yeah. life, had never thought about leaving. And then the trucker thing hit and it was like eye-opening to them. Of, mm -hmm. Okay, we need to get out. Yeah, yeah, that trucker thing was a big wake-up call. One of the videos I did last year actually was, um, or this year, my God, time flies. Uh, this year I went with BJ Dichter, who was one of the lead organizers of the trucker convoy. And I just did like a 48 hour ride along with them, just chatting, you know, while doing one of the truck routes to see what that life is like. And that guy's full of stories about, you know, organizing that whole thing, getting roped into it, the whole, you know, week of just nonstop press and, and spotlight on Canada for a bit there. But there's something, you know, there's, there's this like fighter, I think deep down in, in the Canadian spirit and it comes out at certain points. I think it came out during the, the convoy. Um, that was the largest protest in Canadian history. I think largest peaceful protest by numbers in Canadian history. Um, yeah, Canadians are not known for uh, being protesters. No, no. And we have- Maybe the, maybe the, the ones in the, the French speaking part a little bit more. But, well, they've uh, had some, yeah. <laughs> They've had some, they've had some, some tricky, trickiness there, but yeah, deep, deep down in every Canadian, um, there's a, there's a fighting spirit. And I think the Bitcoiners among us, um, definitely feel like we can't stay on the sidelines. Like everyone that I know that I meet at these meetups, 
is basically doing something work-wise, either creating value or teaching others. And I mean, it's just every Bitcoiner I know from these meetups has eventually gone on to either work for a Bitcoin company or has created value within the space itself. I don't know a single like passive Bitcoiner at these meetups anymore. Every single one of them now is doing something. So yeah, I don't know. Canadian exceptionalism. That's like the one thing that we have is we're good <laughs> Bitcoiners, you know? <laughs> so so back to uh, how you make this all work. You So you've cobbled together a bunch of different things, but yeah. it seems like the film aspect is is your passion. Like that's yeah. the thing you enjoy the most. That's the art mm-hmm. more, more than, not that the other formats are, are not art, but it seems like that's the thing that excites you. Well, and the thing that's been a real paradigm shift is I've, I've made films forever. Like I, I was making them in high school. I made a feature film when I was 17. It was really bad, but I did it because I just like making stuff. And I went to film school. I made short films, put them in film festivals. I've edited everything from like advertisements to music videos. Uh, I'll confess on this show that uh, when I started my own video production agency a few years ago, the first clients we had were, you know, shitcoin ICOs. And I used to do <laughs> animation for I them I bet they well. paid well. They did pay well. <laughs> they did pay well. And, uh, you know, I feel pretty awful about it today. Um, but you learn. And so I've done, I've done everything under the sun uh, in terms of like editing and working on different mediums in film. But, you know, I'd never really been in front of camera much at all. I used to act a little bit in, in high school. Um, but just working with actors and specifically voice actors, I learned so much about uh, vocal work. Specifically during the pandemic, I had this massive transformation in my business model where we were just doing hundreds and hundreds of videos for Amazon products because they add this functionality to add a video into the listing. And there's a lot of companies out there that need the product videos and made a mint doing that for about two years. Um, and so, yeah, like... I come from a very fortunate place in the sense that like I had capital to burn going into this. It wasn't that I started from zero and I tried to make it as a YouTuber. I have cash and I've been spending my own money and my own Bitcoin to make this happen. Um, but, you know, after two, three years of, of you know, part time, one full year of full time, it's getting almost to the point where just working specifically with Bitcoin companies through donations, I'm able to do this almost full time. The, the dream from this part onwards is I want to scale it up to do a full-fledged media company that does stuff on Bitcoin education, but hard money, but do it in a culturally relevant way. I think that there are a few Bitcoin media production companies in this space. Um, They do amazing content, but it is not something that I think still has mass appeal. There hasn't been a, a, a Bitcoin media company that has really gone out with the goal of trying to get a million more, you know, fresh eyes into this space. And I think in order to play that game, you have to take a few more risks. You have to do stuff that might get frowned upon, that might get you into some hot water with people. Um, Like what? Well, you know, getting politicians into interviews and asking them, do you think that the government's responsible for any inflation? And watching them kind of, you know, swallow their, their breath for a bit there. You know, doing uncomfortable stuff like that, maybe on false pretenses, but like, you know, the Ali G show did it and, and, and Borat and all those guys, like it's phenomenal stuff, right? Or, or what Steven Crowder does, uh, you know, where he goes to college campuses and he, he tests kids about stuff, you know, um, stuff that it's hard to look away from. I think that's the challenge is we want people to um, donate their time to listen and to understand the Bitcoin signal that we're putting out. Um, but it takes a lot of work and we have to be willing to go, you know, and really sit down and listen to these things. But I want to create content that people can't look away from that happens to teach them about Bitcoin that gets them just, you know, we all go down this Bitcoin rabbit hole because we're self-motivated to, but I want to, I want to approach it more in the lens of intriguing people about the possibility of what Bitcoin can bring to the world and on the way, making people laugh you know, completely dismantling their worldview and maybe a little bit of a, a, a sardonic or a, or, or a harsh, a harsh way. Cause I just think that you, you feel it. Like you want to sometimes yeah. go up to people and just shake them a little bit, you know? Well, and, and that does work well in that format when they go and ask, you know, the, the college campuses and they ask them questions and you hear the ridiculous answers that mm-hmm. they give. I mean, that's, uh, 
I, I think that really resonates with people and can kind of wake them up to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I had like a little 15 minutes of fame moment about a month ago. I, I made this short and it was one of these TikTok duets where there's this girl asking like, you know, what's one thing that you wish you knew or whatever. And then I, I go on this like 50 second tirade about how, um, you know, the left wants you to focus on this and the right wants you to focus on on that. But the counterfeit class is 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 printing money and they're devaluing all of your time and work and uh, they'll throw anything into the news media to make you forget about that and not look under the rock, you know, and discover the truth. Oh, by the way, here's a cat video if that was too intense. That video got 6 million views on Instagram. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I've it took like a year of messing around with that sort of format of talking to people to get to that point. Um, and who knows if I'm ever going to hit numbers like that again. Uh, that was that was unexpected. Um, but I think the point is, is that that to me proved that there are ways that we can be talking about this stuff that capture the imagination, imagination of everyone. And, you know, when I go onto YouTube and I look at the most popular crypto and Bitcoin content creators, um, all the top ones, you have to go really through the list, are price speculators, news regurgitators. Nothing wrong with that stuff yeah. because the market obviously demands that, you know, the TA. People want to see the TA and people want to see the news and people want to see the interviews. The most popular Bitcoiner that is just, you know, Bitcoin signal content, I think is maybe... Bitcoin University or Trader University, somewhere between uh, Peter McCormack, um, Bitcoin University, Robert Breedlove, Natalie Brunel. These are like the, the Bitcoin signal people. They all have follower counts topping out at around 100 to 250,000. And so to me, I think that there's just so much more opportunity to spread the signal that is coming out of the Bitcoin world and hit much, much bigger numbers than that. It takes a lot of risk taking though. It takes capital to figure this out and time. Um, but I'm feeling like I'm beginning to crack the code and I'm meeting all these ideologically aligned Bitcoiners who also see the need for this content. And we're working to try and build some sort of media collective or something where we can start pushing out this just irresistible, weird, quirky, offbeat, but still high signal content that we hope will will break out from just the Bitcoin sphere. And it's been really helped a lot so far by the hardcore Bitcoiners who have told me things like, you know, your stuff is like the only stuff I can send to my friends and family because it's not like just a clip of Michael Saylor again. Like it's yeah. weird. Like I have one video where I was doing that, you know, that like pinky doll TikTok meme. No, I'm 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 old. I'm okay. I'm not much on TikTok other than when my it's, kids make me look at something. It's so weird to explain it, but you can look up Pinky Doll TikTok. They have these like you can live stream yourself on TikTok and people can send you emojis which represent tokens which represent money on TikTok. And there are these girls who just act like robots and people just send them, you know, a popcorn or an apple or whatever and they go like, "Mmm, popcorn, yum yum yum." This blew up this year. This woman at one point was making a hundred thousand dollars a day doing this. Wait, what? Yeah, weird stuff. Weird stuff. And so I did my own version of it just for shits. And then I like, I did it for ten seconds. And I'm like, okay, listen here. I'm gonna break some hard truth to you. And like that one also blew up. And so it's just like it's just a matter of experimentation and, and, and kind of you know feeling the temperature of the cultural zeitgeist. I think if us Bitcoiners do that enough we're going to start to break through a lot more than, you know, just waiting for the number to go up because that always gets us in the spotlight. Like, okay, yeah. next Bitcoin bull run, like, yeah, all the podcasters, everyone will be looking into it, but I don't want to spend like two and a half years, every four years, just like twiddling my thumbs, you know, just catering to the Bitcoiners only. Like, I think we need to still be trying to break out of the mold. And the way that we do it is to talk about Bitcoin much less from like a, a price or number go up perspective and talk about it more as like a social and cultural movement. Like you have a vote finally in how you want this world to operate. And but it, do you think that it's going to come through those like short viral videos? I mean, and I could be totally wrong this, but I, I see like if, if there was a show that incorporated something like a Yellowstone that like is, you know, a little bit of a drama, soapy type, whatever, but with like, I mean, 
that got people interested in ranching and mm -hmm. things like that. So have you had a show where you could really delve into it? Because there's a lot of drama in Bitcoin. I mean, oh, yeah. There, there there's really always is. something there's going on. There's always. So it seems like the, you know, and there's obviously you got the financial element to it. You have the very idealistic personalities that are battling against each other. It seems like you could put together like a, some type of mainstream show that revolved around the Bitcoin industry in some way that could expose people to the broader principles of Bitcoin. Like a reality TV show, right? Not, not even like, I mean, I'm not a big reality TV show fan, but I feel like there's been other like series that can do something. They can take some segment that people are not that really interested in. And then all of a sudden people are like, oh, I'm interested in that. Mm -hmm. Like, um, well, well, I think the way that a lot of people got orange pilled in the last cycle, it wasn't from people going out and seeking out Bitcoin content. It was from all of these well-spoken, verbose authors, investors in the Bitcoin space going on to outside podcasts. I mean, Jordan Peterson had, you know, all these guys on his show at one point, and, and you've probably been on some totally non-Bitcoin related shows just to talk about what you guys are doing here. I think those have a really big impact. Yeah. And I just think that you can open this up by having people that can speak on behalf of other generations of other cultural niches doing this stuff. And that's why I think like, you know, we need to rev up the, the creators and the weirdos in this space because there's a place for those people where people consume stuff, comedy podcasts, you know, you know, Gen Z finance channels. One of the things that baffles me is actually how few libertarians um, are into Bitcoin. Like I know a lot of libertarians locally that just know a little bit about it, right? And well, and a like, lot of them like it's are like <laughs> anti. It's this bizarre. Well, they're stuck in the gold thing still, yeah. probably, right? But that that's what I mean, though. Is like we we're kind of this uh, I don't know this this cracking. We got all these different tentacles, but we yeah. got to start growing some new ones in some weird places, you know, to kind of. Well, and it is interesting. I mean, that's I mean to be honest, from from the the get go with our project, I knew that it was important to get the story out. Mm -hmm. And so, and just from my past business experience, I know for, for media, they like something that's different that, you know, the headline's going to be grab, grab them, but they also don't want to work too hard. So you've got to kind of serve it up to them mm -hmm. a lot of times. And so I think sometimes in the Bitcoin space that people feel like that's not, you're not being true if you're doing something like that, but it's, if the story doesn't get out, then it's not going to change lives. Like the reason there's been all these other circular economies that have popped up around the world is because people heard about what was happening here. It's not because we were doing something that was so crazy or groundbreaking. Like it was because they actually could see like, wow, mm -hmm. if those idiots can do that there, then we <laughs> can do it here. It was, I mean, it was that simple. And so it is important for the story to go out in order for it to have a much bigger impact. If this had just stayed here in El Zante, it would have changed lives, but much less than it's been able to just by the story going out. So. And, th and that's like, you hit on something precisely, which is I think the, the magic of what you've done here in, in a way that you probably didn't predict is, is how it has sparked the imagination of so many people, right? Like the last place, if I go back five or six years ago, that I would, I would imagine here about Bitcoin is from some tiny little country in Latin America from a beach community. And then, you know, I, I mean, I heard at one point, I don't know if Kelly was joking about this. It was like the most documentaries per capita or something. It actually Salvador. stole that from me. Oh, uh, you stole it yeah, from yeah, you? I, okay. I had uh, put that out. I said uh, the El Salvador had the highest uh, number of documentaries per capita in the world. I mean, I mean, that's that's the power of a good story, yeah. right? Like it just, it captures people and it moves them. And I mean, you guys were the first to do it. I think there's just so many more Bitcoin firsts out there. And it's hard to think of them, whether it's a real world use case, whether it's a certain, you know, celebrity, like we as Bitcoiners, we flock around the firsts of something to, to kind of proudly wave our flag to see, see where Bitcoin's making a difference. Um, in the art space, I just see so much potential for that. You know, artists who really incorporate it symbolically in their work. There's uh, some of them that are breaking out right now. Um, you know, celebrities who integrate it into their comedy routines sometimes. Like we all want to share a comedy bit where someone's riffing on Bitcoin. There's so many firsts. No one's made a Bitcoin musical yet. Right? Like that's weird. <laughs> maybe it will have mass appeal. Maybe it won't, right? 
No one's done a, a, a Bitcoin stage play. We're seeing, you know, Bitcoin songs come out. Um, there's just room for so much. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just really exciting being a part of it. That's what you always want as a filmmaker. You never want to be, I don't know, some people like trying to tell the same story, but do it better. But the best place to be as a filmmaker is to be chasing history unfolding or to be on the precipice of something just so wholly original that you know people can't look away from it yeah so before we get too much further andy do we have that can we play one of the the yeah. shorts that that it's just to give people a little idea of what you do not crypto what the bitcoin white paper turn doesn't the volume up contain the words cryptocurrency or blockchain and while bitcoin is now often labeled as a cryptocurrency its core principles and usage have little to do with the broader crypto industry while celebrities and vcs are busy promoting the next big token or board ape nft bitcoin is pioneered in developing nations to counteract hyperinflationary currency while crypto promoters push retina scanning affinity scams bitcoin developers are preserving privacy and property rights. And as other decentralized currencies run their blockchains on AWS, thousands of globally distributed miners secure Bitcoin through proof of work. From Ripple to Cumrocket, crypto has favored short-term thinking, Ponzi schemes, and insider enrichment. Bitcoin by design has no insiders and no special rights. It works today, serving millions as a tool for financial inclusion against increasingly censored inflationary monetary mediums. So let's focus more on Bitcoin and a lot less on Bitcoins. Bitcoin is so I think that that uh, this type of video I mean it's 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 impactful I think it has it's important but I'm guessing it's much more enjoyable to do the long form shows that that or am I wrong it's a mix um, I really like doing these shorts because number one I think everyone kind of needs a routine. Um, and I'm able to make four or five of these in a day, send them off to my editors and then pump them out. I'm, I'm doing them twice a week now. Um, they've become sort of my barometer on how I want to talk about Bitcoin or hard money with people. And uh, I've probably made around 100 of them now, maybe a little bit more than that. And I've just learned so much through actually just getting them out there. So artistically, they're not super challenging. The biggest challenge in making a video like that is just getting the word count down enough so that you can tell a story in 59 seconds yeah. or less. Um, that has been really fun. I've broken a lot of grammatical rules. I've had people say, oh, you're oversimplifying things. The great thing about those videos is they always spark a conversation. Um, and to be getting into conversations with people at like twice a week is really good, I think, for creators, you know, to, to figure out what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? Getting that feedback from the views, but getting the feedback from the comments too. I mean, I get all this love on Twitter, but I go to Instagram or YouTube and people are calling me like a, an idiot crypto bro who doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And it's great. I used to respond to all the comments. I can't respond to all of them anymore. Um, but that's been a really just, I, I just learned so much from that. So, you know, they're not that creatively technical or, or challenging, but they're just great things to learn from. And I'm going to, keep putting them out there as long as people want them. The documentaries are a different beast because the documentaries really are the passion projects. And the first one I did was coming down to El Salvador and exploring that. And that was sort of like, I know that, you know, when I came down here, I, I, I was like, I'm, I'm one documentary in a sea of documentaries, you know, going over this. Um, and it was more of a way for me to find my footing as to like, well, what's my edge as a filmmaker? Like, what do I bring to the table that's different from all these other guys who have film crews, who have much longer, you know, track records of documentary storytelling. Um, and what I found was really, you know, nice was talking about El Salvador from this like, and, and a lot of the videos have done this. So, I mean, I, I love the way that documentary turned out, but it wasn't too original. But my 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 take on it was, was that like, I think we're witnessing the birth of something hopeful and bright and new for the country. Um, a country that most people had written off for so long. And I think Bitcoin can play a part in that. And the, the documentary ed, ends with, I forget his last name, but his name's Edgar. He does these little like Bitcoin coin ATMs. But he's a Salvadoran uh, entrepreneur who did this. And he he had like, we interviewed him. These journalists found him and, and you know got us an interview with him, and he just had. You talking about the K one? K one, yeah, Edgar. I forget his last name. Um, 
but he was amazing. I'm blanking right now. I'm horrible with names. It's all good. Is his name Ed- Edgar? Edgar from Okay. Yeah, Edgar from yeah. K1. Yeah. Um He's a he's an amazing guy. He's he really an amazing is. guy. He's like the real deal. Exactly. Just- and what I really wanted to get to the root of in that documentary is is kind of more about like what is the Salvadorian identity? Like what does it mean to be Salvadorian and, and you know, how does it feel to have the spotlight on you as a country? in probably the biggest way that it's ever happened. Like, I can't think of El Salvador ever being like so talked about. No, when if ever (laughs) nobody cared about them and when they did talk about them, it was in some derogatory way. It was, there was, but it's weird. It's like, oh, we're we're, like, we're like, at least like when Canada had the spotlight on it for the trucker protest, like every Canadian like knew that story, right? Yeah. But the Salvadorian population has the Bitcoin spotlight uh, shined on it. And most of the people here are like, what's Bitcoin? And like, why is everyone talking about it? You know? But it's funny how, I mean, I think for them, you just sense this pride that they are the center. There was, it was like five or six years ago, it made all the newspapers here that I think it was Charlie Sheen. Was he the one that was in Two and a Half Men? Yeah. He had made some like comment like, I'd rather be a shoe seller in El Salvador than this, like a like as an insult. Yeah. And it was, but it was like, it was in all the newspapers here, but <laughs> it was like, that was, cause El Salvador never ever talked about it. So yeah. when they did, it was in some derogatory fashion. And um, I, I think Trump at, at one point called it, you know, a shithole country and that made the news. So it was always in like a negative way. So mm. now that they're like, have all these articles coming out and you know a lot of them are still are pushing fud and they're and are or bashing the the president but in general they're showing that el salvador is booming you know the beautiful beaches the amazing people leading world forward in bitcoin adoption it's this is a first for them yeah yeah and and like that's the story i wanted to kind of get to the root of like i came to the country i knew a little bit a bit about the history of like fmln and arena but that's really kind of what sparked wanting to do those long form documentaries. As I came down here, I was like, well, we'll tell the Bitcoin story. We'll go check out Chiba. We'll buy stuff at McDonald's. We'll check out Bitcoin Beach. But I want to know a little bit more about, you know, the people. And then the, the story that I, I haven't gotten to make, and I don't know if I ever will. And what, just so, so people can go look for that, what the title of that one was? Oh, uh, it's hard. You're just going to have to go to my channel. Like the title of the documentary was Adopting Bitcoin. And I didn't realize that was the name of the conference <laughs> at the time. Um, so when you look it up, there's a zillion. If you uh, look up Adopting Bitcoin El Salvador documentary, you'll probably find it. Okay. But if you just go to the Kinetic Finance channel, you look through my videos, you'll find okay. it. Um, what I came away from that trip, like the biggest things that impacted me were I've been to a couple different places now in Latin America. And now I have like a bit more of a barometer to compare El Salvador to like Mexico and Guatemala and like Colombia and Peru and Ecuador and all that. Um, El Salvador reminds me, it, it, it it's like you guys are the most shy of all the Latin Americans. And I think it's because of all the, the awful stuff here with like the civil war and the gangs and all that. Um, but it's it's like it's like a flower just starting to kind of like a bloom or a turtle coming out of its shell and uh, you know and it's 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 really beautiful and that was sort of what i came away with was just this like feeling of hope that these people you know that we talked to were not just taking all this spotlight for granted that it was a leap into the unknown and um they were willing to embrace it just like they voted for kelly that was a that was a pretty massive risk to vote for this new party. I know that he was, you know, mayor of San Salvador and he was pretty well known, but that was a pretty big risk to just say, let's throw away the last 40 years and go for this guy. A and brand new party. A brand new party, right? Guy that also like, you know, there are some things, I guess, with Bukele's religious background that not every Salvadoran 100% aligns with. Um, there's a lot of risks with Bukele and it's, it's amazing to see the population was just so starved for change that they went for it. And he's been able to see his vision out pretty well. And it's it's paying off in spades. Like it's, you know, everyone throws the dictator label around. It's like, okay. I Even if you believe that's true, I think most people would rather live in a place where people are happy and hopeful with a dictator than a broken democracy. That's not really a democracy. 
right? I mean, we hold this word. I don't want to get too deep into that stuff, but like we hold this word on like a pedestal. Yeah. Like it's like the be all end all. Oh, as long as we have democracy, everything's going to be all right. It's not true. Especially right? in Latin America, it hasn't. It's not true. Worked all that well yeah. overall. So yeah, it's 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 like a it's like a dog whistle sometimes. Like the way that like the American politicians throw it out. We got to go pr protect democracy in this country. Guess what? You know, some people like having their dictators, right? The same way that like some people that work for a company like having a CEO who makes those decisions for them. Um, does it work forever? No, but you do what you can, you know, and you improve your own life the best way that you can, hopefully without relying on the state to take care of your, your every need. Yeah. Um, the Salvadorans have, have done it for so long and they're finally, you know, getting some attention. The roads are getting fixed. The lights are getting fixed. The crime is getting taken care of. Um, and now people are able to change their time preference and really think longer term about things. And it's just seeing that at the advent of the Bitcoin law, just picking up on notes of that was just really inspiring, you know? So after that film, what was your next project? Um, good question. I'm trying to remember the order of everything. I had a bit of a, I was 21. Yeah, 22 was rough. I was still... A lot of the ways that I made money was I had my own video business. I used to day trade. I was always finding other stuff. So the the, the channel was like a part time thing for a while. Um, the next major video I did was on um, this interesting company in Vancouver called Mint Green, and they take um, hash boards from you know S nines and other miners, and they configure them in such a way that they can harvest the heat from it to replace gas heaters in buildings and other appliances and things like that. And I made a little documentary on that. It took me a very, very long time to understand, like, why are you using Bitcoin miners? Like, this seems kind of weird. Also, you know, like, how's the pricing on that's going to work? Like, that seems like something where you have to have a bunch of capital in the bear market to pick up cheap ASICs or else, you know. And then also, how do you make money? Are you selling the boilers? Are you leasing them? The business model is tricky, and it's been very hard for the CEO to kind of, like, pitch it to people. And it took me hours and hours sitting down with them in car rides to kind of figure it out. But once I did, I said, I think I can do a video out of this and I'll make it and we'll show people it working in real time. And, you know, we'll all just, I'm not going to get paid for it. I'll just do it for fun and it'll be a good thing to have on the channel and see where it goes. And the video, like it didn't blow up viral or anything, but I've shown it to quite a few places because number one, it's like only 10 minutes. And number two, it, it just kind of like, kind of wows people because you think you've seen it all in Bitcoin sometimes, but then you see that, oh, wow, people are using refurbished hash boards to make electric heaters. And the whole heat market is really weird. Like people sell BTUs of heat. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, but yeah, it's really cool. And seeing this thing in action and like the complex engineering that goes into creating a a Bitcoin mining rig that is optimized for heat output and not for hash rate. Yeah, because usually they're trying to have the least heat. Yeah possible exactly yeah and so it's like well we want to we want to run the rigs as hot as we can without you know making them explode so you do want to immerse them to some extent um so you can get more hash rate out but we also need to come up with a mechanism to pull the heat out but you don't want to do it in a way that channels the heat too intensely in one area or another because heat has this gradient where it likes to rise right um so you have to engineer this thing and I think they've changed the model of it. You have to engineer this thing that's constantly moving because if you have too high of a heat gradient at the top of a machine, then you're just going to blow the miners that are that are at the top, right? So you have to keep it spinning. And, but are they yeah, are they weird. liquid? They're liquid immersed, immersed yeah, in dielectric fluid or something like and that. And does the so how does that work? Does the liquid like flow through like a radiator type thing to disperse no, the just, heat? No, they're or? just fully immersed in this cylinder. Okay, but yeah. the, so how how does the how's the heat dissipated? The heat is the heat is vented out of the the machine. So even if you have something liquid immerse, it's still radiating heat. So the heat is just but vented. isn't the heat radiating into the liquid? The heat is radiating radiating into the liquid, but then the liquid is going from like a liquid to air exchange. Hmm. I'm actually a terrible person to explain this. <laughs> You're gonna have to get caught. Well, I'm I'm just it. I'm just thinking of all you could... I know. All I know is that I was in the room with that thing, and it is hot. It is hot in that room. I'm just wondering if you could do something with like the heated floors that you they, could. they do where it circulates through the miners. and uh, You could, yeah. yeah. Well, I was thinking of doing that when I finally build a home. Um, I want to do something with floor yeah. heating. Yeah. So, so this is like a distillery and they needed to 
keep it heated? Yeah, so like the whiskey dry aging process okay. requires okay. some heat. And so they, they don't need like a ton of it, but just like enough ambient, you know, a little, a couple extra, um, you know, Celsius to ambient heat the, uh, the whiskey process. Um, and yeah, it was a pilot project, but there, it was just more of a proof of concept. They're doing now these massive boilers that are essentially replacing gas heaters in, uh, large, you know, central buildings. So, you know, hospitals, they have like a boiler room, right? Yeah. And you're getting now all these carbon credits and things to switch to electrical, but typically unless your electricity is dirt cheap, it's always just way cheaper to do it through, you know, natural gas or yeah. propane, right? In BC, because we have like some of the most abundant hydroelectric in the world, it's now getting to a point where it is cheaper to actually heat with like a good electric heater. It's cheaper than using gas. And then because the government, you know, gives you the carbon tax and all that other stuff in the gas heating, it makes more sense to move to an electric heater and they're going to give you all these bonuses and whatnot. And so they're getting contracts now with, you know, major industrial buildings and industrial, um, you know, boiler plants that heat multiple buildings to install their mechanism. And the way that it works from my understanding, and again, you're going to have to ask Colin this, he's the, he's the maestro behind all of this stuff, um, is that they basically, they lease out the machines, they will do all the maintenance on them at, you know, some contract rate, they keep the Bitcoin. So their business model is a little bit like a Bitcoin miner in that at the end of the day, they're collecting the Bitcoin. But they're okay. also selling and leasing out these products, which are the boilers. So you're paying for the heat. They're, the business is paying for the heat and they're keeping the Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not a public company yet. They've done. So that's the machine there. That yeah. We seem to yeah. be having some internet and issues. And again, that's here, a very but... small scale version okay. of it. They have ones that are 10 to 20 times bigger. And so you can imagine like all the hash boards that are part of that. <laughs> it's a lot of proprietary stuff. Colin, I hope you don't uh, sue me for. <laughs> <laughs> leaking any trade secrets. I try to keep it just the video, but yeah. Um, and that to me, like that was a great way to kind of rope me back. Cause I, I had taken about a year off, you know, between the El Salvador documentary and this one, this was yeah. a great way to rope me back into it. Cause I, there's a lot of great Bitcoin short film makers that are coming into the space, like Paco, Joe Nakamoto, every one of the big, like, you know, yeah. news agencies have somebody who's doing documentaries for them. And my thing is like, I just don't want to do what someone's already done. So I got to go do something wholly original. And I was just fortunate enough that Colin is in Vancouver that I could just make this story right in my backyard. So yeah, it was a really fun one. I'm excited to see what he does next with it. We're gonna we're supposed to do another video when they do like the, the big installation because the big machine is something else. But yeah. So what's next on uh, the docket for you? So the next project, and I believe you have a part in this, is Motive in Peru. So not not officially. We're excited no. about what they're doing there, and but we, you, you've had some advising. And yeah, advising. yeah, and actually, the the guys from Motive are, are here right now yeah. in in El Zante. So we so spent some time there, and yeah. So the two guys that run that, um, well, it's a big team, but the the kind of the you know the head decision makers are are Richard and Valley, and they both have really interesting backgrounds in in civil service and volunteer work and all that. Um, They've gone now to almost 15 or maybe more villages. I don't know. The number is growing. They're taking something similar to what you guys are doing, but they are light speeding it ahead in Peru. And I'm half Peruvian. I have family there. And uh, I've been kind of following what they're doing. But I know the, the biggest struggle that they've had is that they haven't really been able to tell that story too well. Um, Paco and Joe beat me to the scoop. They were there in September. Joe just does like unreal documentaries as well. Um, so he's going to have something coming out there. Well, he's too. got that soothing voice that goes along with it. Yeah, so. I gotta have, a, I gotta work my British <laughs> accent, you know, he's very authoritative, but he's, I mean, he's a real journalist. He yeah. knows how to go into places, get the interviews. He's, he's a polyglot. I think he speaks like four or five languages fluently. The guy's a wizard. That's what I need to work on. I've been, I've been on my Duolingo to, to keep up with my Spanish, but it's not, it's not too great. Um, what I'm doing, because I was trying to figure out like, oh crap, like Paco and Joe are already in there. They're such likable guys. They do this great like guerrilla filmmaking. You know, how am I going to do it differently? I spoke to Joe um, and, you know, basically, you know, they, they visited as many of those towns as they could, but there's tons. Like there's some in Cusco in the mountains. There's some in Terrapoto in the jungle. Yeah. There's some just outside of Lima. 
And each one sort of has like a different story. But the the model for motive, um, the way that it works is that they're going into these towns and they're setting up, you know, Bitcoin in people's wallets, but it doesn't really end there. The, the big component is they go in and they set up these education centers. They find out, okay, if you're in the mountains, maybe you got the alpacas and the llamas, you can shear them and you can make clothing and articles out of them, right? Maybe you're outside of Lima, you know, maybe you can set up a kitchen, start baking some stuff, right? And instead of just, you know, trying to, to hustle this stuff into the main cities and the main hubs or in the local neighborhoods, we'll set you up with Bitcoin wallets so that you can start doing the transactions in Bitcoin. And not only does this make much more sense than trying to figure it all out in Soles, which is just like a disaster digitally, you know, you have to have ID and all that stuff. It doesn't work in these really poor neighborhoods. Um, it also allows them to have savings accounts for the first time. It's very similar to the El Salvador story. The, the challenge is, is that Peru is a country, it's much bigger, but it's so disparate. It's sort of like 20 different countries. Yeah. And they've taken on this monumental task. Um, and I think it's just out of the kindness of their hearts of trying rather than just focusing on one place, trying to help out multiple people in the same time. So they've done these volunteer projects. Like there's kids in the Andes that, you know, their, their feet freeze off and they die young in the winter because they don't have proper shoes. Like in this day and age, it's crazy to me when you go into like- Yeah, that high altitude and still wearing sandals and yeah. it's, uh, yeah. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of forgotten people. And I think one of the reasons they've also tapped into this Bitcoin thing, um, you know, besides offering these people some financial sovereignty is it also links them to the rest of the Bitcoin world. We like seeing Bitcoin used to advance, you know, human rights and freedoms and extend, you know, longevity and stuff like this in some of the craziest places in the world. So um, I'm going there and this is really fun. I'm going with Isabella Santo. She's the host of Bitcoin Backstage on Bitcoin Magazine. She's Peruvian and uh, I wanted to do this documentary, um, but I was like, oh man, like we have to go to at least three or four places. It's in Peru. Um, it's going to be challenging doing all these things. Some places with internet, some not. Some places don't even speak Spanish. They speak, you know, Quechuan, like native languages. Yeah. Um, and what we're hoping to do is just use kind of my template for telling stories. I went to Guatemala, um, Panajachel, Bitcoin Lake. That's been my most successful full long length documentary in terms of like viewership. Well, I don't know if you remember, but I, you know, told you at that time to go to Peru and you yeah. would have, you would have. And you did. You would have been there before uh, Joe and Paco. You did. You, you, were, did. Uh, you were a little slow on the uptake. I was, so. I was too slow. I was working some fiat jobs to, <laughs> to, to make the cash. But yeah, I, um, I, I took, you sent me that stuff. You were the first person to actually show me the motive stuff. Um, but yeah, it was hard for me to kind of figure out the model there, like what yeah. they were actually doing with the Bitcoin and why and all that. And um, what I've what I've decided to do with like a bit more of my storytelling is focus less on kind of this more like journalistic top down view of how everything works and just talk to people and how it's impacted them. Because I just find that let someone tell you their story of how they've been impacted by Bitcoin. And that will tell more than if I just tell you how to feel about it and tell you how it's working. We'll have some narration in this, but what we're hoping to do, the structure of this documentary will be going into three to four different villages and talking to basically the most successful entrepreneurs that have come from no entrepreneurial background to selling baked goods, to selling clothing in the cities and doing it all through the help of Motives programs. So the documentary will be It'll be about Bitcoin, but I would say only about 20, 30 percent of it will be about Bitcoin. We're not going to do like a full overview of like, how does Bitcoin work here yeah. and all that? Like it's it's we know it's the wallets, it's it's blink or it's whatever wallets. What's really important is I think Bitcoin inspires people to find sovereignty when you can own the fruits of your own labor, when you have the access and the freedom to have that stuff flow. It changes your time preference, number one, but it changes your outlook in terms of economic opportunity. They now don't only have to sell their stuff to one major hub that someone has to walk from, right? They can pay people to come to their towns. They can pay them instantly with Bitcoin to come to their towns, pick stuff up, spread it out to different places, right? So it opens up all these different economic avenues to enable sovereignty. And what it also does, is it allows people to help out their own community. I mean, this is one of the struggles with when certain people are uplifted in a community the first tendency is to kind of like get the hell out of Dodge, right? Like the kids do that all the time in these villages. They turn 18, it's still a mess there. They, they get out and they, they, they wish they could come back, but they usually don't, right? They go to greener pastures. And with Bitcoin, you know, as long as you can produce something of value, whether it's something online, maybe some of these people in these villages, as long as they have Starlink, they can be graphic designers, yeah. right? 
you can do all this stuff and you can stay where you are and you can give back to your community. And that's a big part of it too. And, and I think Peru for a very long time, people have had like these survival mentalities in some of these places. I think a lot of Peruvians can attest to that, especially outside of Lima. And I think Bitcoin and, and the integration of some of the motive programs, I think it's very, very early for them. But if it works, I think it can bring a, a different positive wave to Peru. And, and Peru, Peru is an enigma because that was like, it was like the breadbasket of the world. Like so many innovations we have today came from the Incans. And it's so weird today that it's just this really divided country that has well, it's crazy because there's such extreme poverty, but there you can tell there's so much wealth there too. Yeah, but it's it's definitely like a huge divide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a weird place, and even even the the way that you have like Lima, which is like crazy desert that. I mean, I've never been to a place that was that dry before. I mean, mm -hmm. when people would describe it to me, it still was kind of shocking when I was there. There's like literally not even a blade of grass and unless it was like an irrigated place, it was just nothing. It's like the city just sits amongst sand dunes. But then you go up into the Andes and you've got these just crazy mountain environment. You have the jungles there and mm -hmm. it really is. And then you go north and you have these epic surf beaches too, just like miles. I did not just, make it there, but I have heard that. Yeah, M Mancora, I was there for a week last year. Um, incredible, incredible country. Like there's just so much ecodiversity. How's the, is the water in Mancora, is it warm or is it cold? Because we went here. surfing and the here. water was cold. That was like, man, I'm too old and fat to put a wetsuit <laughs> on, so. It's definitely colder than here um up there but it's still really nice like kind of like yellow sand beaches um that's a hop in town that's like a very right place for a bitcoin circular economy because they get a lot of local tourists there mm -hmm. peru is you know like they take visa and mastercard most places there um but you know you still got to deal with foreign exchange and then you know the the really tricky part about peru is like in cusco you have all these villages in the mountains there and there are these big language barriers once you start to really go outside because you get people who don't speak a lick of spanish um and one of the nice things has been the the tour, tour operators have really tried to take people through some of these towns so that you know the the people going on the tour can donate and they can hire locals to help carry the food up mountains and stuff i did this like four day expedition through the mountains and uh man, like you go to some of these towns and, and like the statures are different. Like everyone is under five foot five, but they're used to the the air there and they're chewing the coca leaves. So they can they can scale these mountains without breaking a sweat. Our, our tour guide was like playing the pan flute while we were like scaling these mountains. And I was, I was <laughs> <You're> dying. Like... <laughs> I was going five minutes and then I was just, uh, I felt like I was gonna collapse. All of us felt we were gonna collapse. He's just like, he's just like, come on guys, hurry up. Just wild. And um, I don't know where I was going with that, but yeah, those guys have been very responsible for at least trying to bring some of the equity up to these villages on these tours. Peru had a really rough time during COVID where the whole country shut down. They had one of the worst mortality rates. Yeah, it was, it was like world. off the charts. It was like two times like the next mm. highest. It was so their, their tourism industry, like they've lost like two years of, of tourism revenue, basically. I mean, I think. 22 was okay, maybe. Um, so not only do they need to get that revving up in full swing, because tourism is always competitive. Like people, yeah, they always want to go to Machu Picchu, but you know, you need to compete for people's dollars yeah. to, to attract them to your country. And there's so much more in Peru beyond Machu Picchu. And um, Motive is hopefully going to be playing a part in that too, where they're going to be enabling some of these tour operators to accept Bitcoin. And then these tour operators will hopefully reach out to the broader Bitcoin community to start doing, you know, Bitcoin expeditions and stuff like Roatan in the Honduras is already sort of bandwagoning that idea a bit where they're offering like tours for Bitcoiners to come and, and you know, see all the circular economies and then go on, go on another adventure. I think Bitcoin has like a really right place in tourism experiences because not only do us early Bitcoiners have money to spend on experiences and, and seeing the world, but if you can somehow integrate like a bit of Bitcoin culture into that and then also, you know, spend your Bitcoin in, in, in Cusco at a, at a nice cafe that has some Bitcoin yeah. merch and then, you know, go trek the Andes for another four days. It's a whole other avenue of making money. Well, plus it's just so much easier if you can spend Bitcoin. You have to worry about converting currencies. Oh, or it's home. The worst. I mean, it's, yeah. it's 
I'm spoiled living here in El Salvador. When I go other places, I forget. Like, I feel like, wow, I'm going back into the past where I have to go to an ATM it's, and pull money out. And then if I don't have the right change. It's and, a gut punch for Canadians every time we have to like buy American dollars because it just gets worse for us every year. It's I think it's now one US dollar is a dollar 35 Canadian. So one of our dollars uh, only gets us about like 70 cents American now. Well, and it's 138. Or 138. Oh, yes. God. And Whoa. it's hard. It's hard in a lot of places even to find people that will trade Canadian dollars. Oh, nobody wants it's... Canadian dollars outside of Canada. You can't <laughs> spend Canadian dollars in Mexico. Well, I, even in El Salvador, there was a, a Canadian guy here that I met at church, and he was like, hey, I brought down a bunch of Canadian dollars, and I, I'm out of money, and I can't find any. And I thought, for sure, there'd be a place. And no. There was finally we found one. There's a, a local business here that caters to Canadians. And so I think he was able to like exchange with some that were leaving, going back to Canada. But yeah, yeah Canadian dollars are even. Uh, nobody wants to. Buy nobody them. wants it. No. And they're nice. And, you know, they used to be paper and they turned them into plastic. And now they're I saw a thing where someone compared a, a stack of $100 Canadian bills that were paper to a stack of the new plastic ones. And the, and the plastic ones were like half the thickness. <laughs> Technically, so. There so you they're go. actually plastic. Yeah, they're plastic and there's a rumor and it's it's like a weird mind trick now that I tell you about it, maybe maybe you'll see it. You don't have any Canadian dollars, do you? No. Okay, so there's a rumor that apparently the $100 Canadian bill has a little maple leaf in the corner. You probably know about this one. You scratch it and it smells like maple syrup. Yes. Do you think it does? Yeah. Yeah, I think it does too. But apparently it's just apparently like a- they say. It's, no, no, it's just yeah. like a placebo thing. But yeah, I swear to God, you scratch the hundred dollar Canadian bill, it smells like maple syrup. So our money has literally turned into scratch and sniffs. I don't know. I'd much rather have Bitcoin or the U.S. dollar. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. So you're you're going to Peru in a month? Is that what you said? Two weeks. Two weeks. Oui. And so this and is. And how long are you going to spend there? Uh, nine days filming this okay. and then I'll probably be there for another three days with some family. Um, this has been the craziest thing. So you changed my life on this because previously it's just been going around as sponsors, begging for money for them to help me with my crazy documentary ideas. No promise of return. Some of the videos get a thousand views. Some get 4,000, some get 50,000. I have no idea. Yeah. Sponsors hate that. And it's a bear market. No one has any money. And so I asked you like, well, how, how should I like raise for this? And you said, just, just do it out in the open. And I never thought about that. And I realized, yeah, I've sort of been doing that with the other videos, but it's more like after the fact, you know, help pay my bills. Um, but then you had the idea of like, well, just also, you know, if people want to sponsor it, just give them the option. You can use Geyser Fund or something and, and just offer the sponsorship options there. And I was like, well, fuck it. Like I'm going to, I'm going to make it anyways with my own money or, you know, with the Bitcoin community. And, um, so I spent quite a bit of time making this, this geyser fund page explaining you know, where the money is going and, you know, the dates that we're going to film this and other stuff that we've done and, and who's coming with me. And then the fun part is, is like, we have all these different rewards. I was trying to think the, the hardest thing with crowdfunding for an intangible, that's not a product is like, how do you give people value? Yeah. And so I looked at, I used to do Kickstarters for, you know, other products and I looked at all their campaigns and I said, okay, like one of the things that we can do is that um, we can give people IMDb credits, you know, producer credit, whatever, right? We can give people rough cuts of the film if they want to see it early. Um, but we can also do things like if you send or you buy one of the perks, we'll donate half of it to uh, someone there and we'll film it. So during our trip, I think, I don't know, I think it's now we have like seven people who pick that. Um, we're going to just give Bitcoin to some of the, some of the people there that are working on things and we'll interview them and we'll throw those videos up on Twitter. And then we made these other little like sponsorship tiers, which we've sold most of them. Um, and all these like Bitcoin companies really wanted to be a part of it. They, they know me through the shorts, which has just been amazing. Um, and you know, we're going to give them shout outs on social media, you know, put their logo on the film, just like yeah. trying to shop the film out to. Not the highest bidder, but but we're trying to just get like Bitcoin companies who want to be a part of this. And we raised, I think, fit, was it, is it 15 million sats now? Yeah, about, almost 16 million. We did that all in the first like 72 hours. It's kind of slowed down because I haven't really posted much about it. But um, we'll have to do a push when this uh, yeah. when this comes out. It's a 55% of that budget. And like. The other, the other forty five percent is I'm getting an editor to edit this. I've been editing all my own work for a long time, but it takes months, and I can't always be the editor. Yeah. 
Um, so I thought with this one too, you know, I'll have a budget, we'll get an editor, we'll get a Bitcoiner editor. So I'm gonna try and just pay him with the proceeds from this. Um, but you know, everything else is basically covered, which is amazing. And we did it all in 72 hours and it was from the grace of, I think we have 80, 80 different, uh, you know, plebs and companies have contributed to this, which has just been phenomenal. Um, so yeah, like, I, I don't know. I, I know there's other films and projects that have crowdfunded through Geyser, um, but I have never seen one do it this quickly. And I was just blown away by the support from people on this. So they want to see it happen. Um, I'm going to do my best to make like the best film possible. I'm doing something really interesting with this because Isabella, who's a part of this, I, I'd seen her stuff. She's another great Bitcoin creator. Um, I've never actually met her in real life. So we're going to meet for the first time down there. <laughs> Hopefully, you know, be good co-hosts covering this whole thing. She's going to, you know, she's essential for helping conduct interviews there. And Do you speak I, Spanish? Un poco. Un, poco. un, po un poquito. <laughs> <laughs> Solo, uh, okay, yo, yo um, practiqué con Duolingo por más o menos um, ocho mil días. I've been doing, I have 800. A thousand days? No, ocho cien. Ocho cientos. Oh my God. Okay, well, I've embarrassed myself <laughs> enough. I have an ocho ciento día streak <laughs> on Duolingo. Duolingo is not the way to learn a language. I need to get a proper tutor. I need to just be down here, man. I gotta, yeah, I gotta yeah. find El Salvador. But I'm trying. You know, I'm making all my uh, the other half of my family. Uh, but she speaks Facebook. Spanish, I'm assuming. Oh yeah, she's okay. She's, okay. she's good. So you're um, set. I have to try. Yeah, you know, yeah, you have yeah. to you have to put in the you have to put in the work, the proof of work. Um, but that's fun. And I also think too, like, she's great. Like, we need more people like her in the Bitcoin space. Young, full of energy has the the i guess i don't want to say like a like a woman's perspective on things but i mean she's taking a real risk doing this like we're going to some places that are pretty offbeat like three hours outside of cusco in the middle of nowhere without internet and she's done a lot of hosting gigs she's interviewed a ton of people at these conferences but she's never done a documentary like this and i was like okay she seems really cool I know how to at least at the bare minimum, I can just stay behind the camera the whole time and just film her interviewing and, and experiencing all this. But I think together we're going to make something really cool. Well, and that's what it's all about, right? Just having fun. Those communities are, I mean, some of them are pretty rough. Yeah. It's even the ones that you look on the map, they look like they're in Lima. Mm -hmm. So just be aware of this. It I looks know. like it's not like, oh, we could go here and then go here. It's like, four hours in traffic getting from the one to the other but yeah and they are you know I've, i'm obviously no stranger to poverty and to you know in el salvador there's you know a lot of places where people live in dire situations but the poverty i saw in peru was on a different level and it's i think intense. too because it's so dry and there's no no greenery around and there's just trash heaps and sand and like they're living in the dust. It was, it was, yeah. Yeah. It's so definitely be prepared for that. It's, it's going to be intense, but that's what's, that's what's so fun. And that's why I can't imagine doing films on anything else right now. It's like the adventures that Bitcoin takes you on. Like the conferences all around the world are one thing, but getting to go on the front lines of this stuff, hopefully not getting super close to risking my life, but being able to be one of the yeah, first. Yeah, I, I never felt scared there, but yeah. you, you just felt like. I mean, the, on the, edge. The, the poverty was palatable. You could yeah. see like in the desperation and, and the people there. Yeah. And, and then, but also like the light and how amazing it was, what, what the motive uh, group is doing there. I mean, and how Bitcoin is impacting people's lives. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think like beyond Bitcoin, you know, the, the world and a lot of people around the world they need to know that they have the power to change their own destiny. And it doesn't take governments or NGOs airdropping cash on people to make that happen. It really just takes education. And that's why I think what Motive is doing so admirable is because they just don't want to replicate that model of like, here's our budget. We got all these nice donors who love to have like the pictures of the children. Let's keep airdropping the money and no one learns anything. Um, I'm not, I don't want to put all that stuff in one lumped category, but I think a lot of NGOs go down that route. They become reliant on these donations. And because they don't actually set up long lasting infrastructure, when the donations dry up, these communities go right back into poverty. And I think what they're doing is a little different. 
they're harnessing, you know, you know, real capitalism to try and pull these communities out of, of the poverty that they're in. And I think that's what Bitcoiners are all about. It's about shaping your own destiny and having control over your life. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's going to be a matter of like tying all those things together, showing a bit of the Bitcoin side, but really the hope that I think is beginning to spring up there that is similar to what has been captured here in the early days of Bitcoin Beach that has now flourished into something yeah. just beautiful. So people can hop on your geyser page. Is there a, a title to it? What, yeah. How do they find it? Yeah, geyser, geyser.fun slash project slash kinetic Peru. Or if you want to just zap us, um, there are perks if you do it through the site. If you want to just send sats, it's kinetic Peru at geyser.fund is the LN URL. So what, what are the fun perks that, I mean, what are... Um, so there's certain amounts where like if you donate, uh, you have to do it before December 1st for some of them. Um, uh, we'll take half your donation and give it out. And you we'll offering any it. like cameo roles in the in the film? If you want to, <laughs> if you want to, if you want to come fly down there and be a part of it, come for it. You know, you don't even have to donate. If you want to come and you can take care of your plane tickets, join us. Sure, um, it's it's going to be intense, but yeah, it's fun. And, and I think part of this too is you know, as a filmmaker, you, you're sort of creating jobs a little bit on the way. Like we're going to hire someone down there, hopefully another Bitcoiner who happens to know film help shoot some of the stuff with us. Um, you know, one of the people in Cusco that we're staying with uh, owns a hotel chain. We'll be staying in his hotel and we'll pay him in Bitcoin to stay there. So you know, this money just circulates it, like a real circular economy back into these communities yeah. in some way. And then the ultimate goal, the real ultimate goal on this is to really make a, a really entertaining, I want to say about 20 minute documentary that shows what is working with the motive program down there and hopefully inspires more people to put capital towards that. Cause I do think that they are one of the biggest change makers in the space right now that are using Bitcoin and really advancing human rights. And yeah, that story just really needs to be told. It, it does because they, like I said, we've I've spent a lot of time with the guys from motive. We've, we've been down there, been to the communities and I was very impressed that you never know what, you know, Mm -hmm. Is it really going to be real? But yeah, there's real impact there. And just the number of communities that they're doing. I don't know how Valley like has enough hours in the day to keep up with, you know, 15 different communities that they have. He's a guy who can, he's a guy who can never rest on his laurels. I think as soon as he feels like something's going and, and he's ready to just let it take care of itself, he just moves on to the next thing. And you know, I don't know if that's the perfect model. I don't know what's going to happen. I know that motive is constantly adapting to the information that they're getting. But I was hearing the other day that, you know, Blink, which they're setting a lot of people up with down there, they're doing like 70,000 transactions a month. That's incredible. Yeah, I, I heard that figure. Was that a month? Was that what it was? I, I think so. I heard that figure. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty remarkable. I know that came as a surprise to the Galloway team because they're like, what are all these transactions in Peru? I was like, that's the project I was telling you about. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of like Bitcoin companies too, you know, in the bull market, they'll have some extra capital. And if they want to do something that's aligned with what their vision is, like Motive's the perfect project for that too. Yeah. So. Hopefully we're coming up to that season. Where <laughs> bull market, baby. I don't know. This year's been pretty good. I yeah, have no complaints. Yeah, yeah. I have no complaints. No, no. It's, but I think, I think in the Bitcoin company space, they're still hanging on by their fingernails, a lot of them. So people aren't loosening up the purse strings yet to support projects. I'll tell, you, projects I'll tell and, you what I'm really curious about. And I'm curious on your take on this too, is that BlackRock and, and I don't know about Vanguard, but all the other ones, like they'll eventually all get their ETFs, right? And so they're not just going to be like, buy this ETF because of Bitcoin, you know, go watch a Michael Saylor podcast. No, they're going to be financing their own media engine on this and having to basically undo all the FUD stories that maybe through a third party they've been funding for the last 10 years, right? <laughs> like BlackRock's not going to release a Bitcoin <laughs> ETF and then just not, you know, try and justify Bitcoin mining. Yeah. They're going to pour in millions of dollars into this stuff over the long run. And for multiple years, as long as financial advisors are buying it, they will be funding a media engine to talk about, you know, Bitcoin as, you know, a solution or whatever. So what I wonder is they're probably going to have some ESG mandates and hopefully some of the capital from those organizations go to projects like this. I have no qualms about accepting a check from BlackRock as long as I get to control the fruits of you know whatever I produce yeah. and I'm not lying to people. Um, but you know, as these get involved, I think 
as we've talked about with like the artistic capital and, and the cultural impact of Bitcoin, I think hopefully, not that I'm rooting for, you know, BlackRock to sponsor all us, you know, plebs to make stuff, but I think some of that will flow into some genuinely good projects that are just there to tell the truth about Bitcoin. Yeah. No, so. I hadn't thought about that, but I think you're right because mm -hmm. especially because they they have been spreading so much FUD over the years. They they are doing this about face. And yeah. so they are going to have to be able to justify it. And there are real stories that will help them do that. Totally. I mean, yeah. Like what's happening in Peru is is definitely something that I could see a company wanting to help showcase. Yeah. And, you know, obviously help fund through that. So yeah. so maybe, maybe, maybe it'll be, a, you know, they're. There's definitely going to be some negatives from all these, the you know, the Black Rocks coming into the space, but maybe there'll be some positives too. I think so. And that's the thing is like the Bitcoin maxis get really upset and they throw the baby out with the bathwater sometimes. Like, you know, I don't want to name names, but like there are companies out there that have done amazing things and then they'll do one thing to betray people and then you never bring up that name again. Yeah. Right. And it's like you have to look at things for net what they are. And a lot of these companies are really trying their best to get the Bitcoin signal out there. And, um, you know, we I think it's just Bitcoin works because it's decentralized. And I think that the way that we learn about it will continue to work better that way as well. Like, I don't think you're going to see Bloomberg have like a Bitcoin. Well, they probably already have a Bitcoin hour there. But I think the way that people consume media, just like today, they don't go to CNN and, and junk anymore. They will continue to look uh for smaller creators or a myriad of different voices to kind of explain Bitcoin to them. And um, it'll be nice, I think, as number goes up, those opportunities to turn those passions into careers and businesses will be amazing. Yeah. yeah. So where can Larry Fink get a hold of you and uh, when he wants to, to sponsor this? Hit me up, Larry. <laughs> um, Larry Fink can uh, reach me directly from my uh, Noster N pub. No, he won't do that yet. Maybe soon. We got to get uh, Larry on, on, on Noster too. Um, he can hit me up on Twitter, kinetic underscore finance, um, kinetic finance, one word on most other platforms. But if you look up kinetic finance, you'll see my mug um, on Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, whatever. And yeah, going to keep people updated on all the, you know, the Peru stuff soon, but so many other projects in the work too. That's the fun thing is one of my biggest lessons from last year was don't go anywhere without a dream project because you never know who you're going to meet at these things. And if people know you and they like your work, you run into somebody who's well capitalized. You should have something to pitch to them. They, they, they give that advice to everyone in the film industry too. Like if you're a screenwriter, never have like something in the bank or never don't have something in the bank when you go to events. Like always have something that you could use the money to capitalize and, and produce in the future. And so I have a lot of that going on right now. Um, this is expanding, you know, much bigger than I thought it would. I would say at the at the at a reasonable pace, but yeah, it's exciting. And I think I, I just implore everyone who watches this, who who if they feel like their thing to offer to Bitcoin is communicating about it in a different way, to just get out there and start making stuff. Don't be afraid to fail. Be patient because it takes a long time to really find your voice when you start. But we need you guys like, you know, it's an army that we're assembling here to basically get out the truth and every foot soldier counts. Yeah. Well, and it's and it's a lot of work. So people need to realize that going in. You it see is. a lot of a lot of podcasts that do like three episodes and then they're done because they're mm. like, wow, this is a lot of work. Be, be, don't do it if you're not willing to put in a year yeah. without any results. We, we we're like. We'll we'll do two years and and after two years we'll evaluate because that's it takes that long for people yeah. to hear about it and it's you know yeah decide if they like it want to want to follow what you're doing so. yeah and it's a hard format like man I don't know about you it's way easier for me to be a guest than a host yeah it's definitely easier I enjoy being a host because then I get to ask people all these questions that would feel rude if you were just in a normal conversation you know the, the thing that how do you I, make your money how do you, you know, so you can like dive into more detail so I love that I love just how I get to I mean I was just doing uh what was the one that we were doing uh why am I blanking who did who do we song. oh yeah Jimmy song last night. And I didn't know that there was this history with the uh, Vitalik writing the white paper for the 
color coins project that Jimmy <laughs> was like one of the programmers for. And, and, and I've known Jimmy for a, a long time and I didn't know anything about this. So yeah. just getting people sitting uh, across from you in this format, you, you can dig out all these details. So I enjoy that part, but mm -hmm. it's definitely less work being the guest than you can just sit I, there and riff on what you want. I find like my biggest problem, and maybe it's just because I've just listened to so many Bitcoin podcasts is like, I don't know how I would do one myself. Like I've, I've tried and I, I always feel like I have to have an angle on something. And so there's one that I'm like sort of, I've, I've recorded a bunch of interviews, but I just feel like I was just so awkward in them as a host. So I haven't put them out, but I was thinking like, well, maybe down the line, like a Bitcoin creators podcast could be cool. Like who are the people who took massive career risks to just yap about Bitcoin all day and like, how do they do it? Um, so maybe that'll come one day, but I yeah. find it hard because I'm a guy who likes to really do a lot of research on people. But then it doesn't flow as well. As well, just that's what I found if if and, and maybe it's just everybody's going to go into it differently. But if I try to prepare too much, then it feels too scripted. And I'm like, oh, but if I just sit down and just start a conversation and talk through it, for me, it works better. Yeah, I got to um, try that. I've also been not been doing them in person. Been yeah, over Zoom. It's different, right? No. And that's why we made a commitment, even though it's a lot harder. And, and you know, obviously you're limited in who you're going to get when they have to be here in El Zante. Mm -hmm. uh, although of any place to host a podcast, I think it's one of the best in the Bitcoin space because you always have interesting Bitcoiners coming through. Mm -hmm. But it's. I'm, I feel privileged because we've been able to make this podcast really geared towards supporting Bitcoin circular economies and what is happening here in El Salvador. So we're able to get a huge variety of people that nobody's heard of before that are doing interesting things. Because mm. the reality is the, the formula for a successful podcast is you get guests on that have a lot of their own followers and that drives your own audience. Exactly. So if you really have to do those numbers, but then, I mean, that's why you have the same like 20 people doing the rounds of all the different podcasts. And not that, I mean, I enjoy listening to those other podcasts, but it gets a little old after a while. You're like, okay, I've heard that story like five times. Now, well, so. that's my, that's my challenge too, is like, I'll get people that I've never seen on podcasts I've interviewed. And then I'll have people that I have seen on podcasts and I'm like, consciously trying to figure out like what question can I ask them that they haven't been asked before because I don't want to hear because I know that the Bitcoin podcast listeners like they listen to there's a lot of overlap in something yeah. that they hear and I'm like I don't want to be contributing to that but we'll see maybe it's not my thing but I'm I'm super no happy I think that what what you're doing it. takes a lot more skill <laughs> so I I would encourage you to stay stay in I mean not that you can't do both but I mean that's what I think we need is people out there telling the stories I mean Bitcoin podcasts are going to be interesting to Bitcoiners mostly, but what you're doing is interesting to the broader market. And that's what I think is needed. I appreciate that. So, yeah. Yeah. Just got to keep it going. All right. So people follow you on, on Twitter, Noster, donate to this upcoming Peru thing. We want to make sure that's fully funded. Yeah. And, and, if, and if you can't donate, although everyone has a couple sets kicking around somewhere, um, sharing the videos watching them giving me feedback reviews yeah. yeah like if you think i've done a bad job on something i almost appreciate those comments more than the compliments because everyone watches some of my stuff and i think just because there's not a lot of like you know filmmakers going out and doing crazy stuff everyone's like oh this is so great but i know sometimes like i fudge details on things or you know, maybe my camera work's not too good or i you know the scripting wasn't great like, I really appreciate the constructive criticism. It's one of the reasons I hated film school is because no one would just give it to you raw and honestly. And I've had great experience with Bitcoiners and I have like a Telegram group with a couple other YouTube Bitcoiners um, who give raw, honest feedback. And we need more of that too. It's an opportunity in this space to just like embrace honesty. So do you prefer that to be public feedback or private DMs or? Either way. Either way. Either okay. way. If you want to humiliate me, go for it. You know, just yeah, don't. Yeah, uh, thick skin. That's you know, good. Try. I like it. I try. I like it. <laughs> All right. Well, when when's when can we expect the Peru video to be up? Um, oh, I don't want to give a date. Let's 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 I, I, you know, let's you nail you, let's far. nail let's nail you down on this so that um, uh, we can hold. I'm going to give it. you one that's further than I think, but I think a far date would be like end of March. It'll be before okay. the having. You'll okay. see it. Um, and lots of other stuff coming around that time too. But yeah, before the having. Are you going to come to El Salvador for the having party? I don't know if I want to talk about this on the air, but I have like a crazy, crazy plan I'm trying to get funding for. So if you're going to cut a part of this podcast, sorry, by the way, how are we like way over time? 
No. We don't have an overtime. There's no overtime. There's no, no like, overtime. what time is it? Well, uh, we're at about a minute, uh, an hour and 40 minutes. Okay, cool. I just, because my dad's winning the thing. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Cut all that. Um, so in lieu of the having party, um, you know, did you did you have Paco on the show? Paco de, de India? India? Yeah. Yes, I have, I have been with Paco in like a zillion different countries. I always joke that he's stalking me. He follows yeah. me in all these places. So Paco and I are planning to do a 21 city euro road trip from april 10th to like may 10th and i don't know if we're gonna get the funding for it i'm i'm drafting budgets it looks like we're gonna need like 50 grand we're gonna have like an editor a, a videographer and it's just gonna be like paco and i doing meetups weird social experiments like finding bitcoiners in random cities and trying to like zero sats in the wallet like work at a random bitcoiners business for a day to get gas to go to the next city for the car really like wacky stuff because i just know he's i mean he's been everywhere he's done everything under the sun but um i want to bring some of my like directorial stuff to just his energy and then be a part of it too. do a bit of a collaboration and do some social stunts like we just had this crazy euro trip idea we're going to do daily videos a video every single day five six minutes editor in the truck doing it between rides um dream projects once all this stuff is filmed and it's off to the editors we're going to try and work that out we'll see if we can get the funding for it if it's too much it's too much but that would be in lieu of not going to the having party um, all right well i, I guess that would scoop. be a valid ex valid uh, excuse to miss but otherwise first, first scoop i have to see how El salvador yeah i have to see how people will receive all the new videos but paco like guys full of energy and it's like i gotta make this stuff while i'm young although you gotta still. make him run i told him he's starting to get fat like me <laughs> he's, he's uh, I, I, uh, I said, it's, it's run, run with Bitcoin. And so he's, uh, yeah, I've had the opposite thing. I've gotten like skinnier since I've done all the Bitcoin stuff. You can go back to my old videos. I was like at least 30 pounds heavier. But. Oh man. I wish I, I went the opposite direction. I've, I've spent too much time on my computer and not enough time surfing. So. What you gotta do is you gotta look at your, uh, your, uh, your block folio account more often. It'll, it'll make you like not buy food <laughs> when the price goes down. <laughs> <laughs> Worked for me. Um, and all the all the carnivore diet nuttiness that the bitcoiners love yeah I, I jumped on that bandwagon for a bit and it worked but yeah i it works it's just it's not super convenient a lot of times no, <laughs> no. especially when you're when you're traveling yeah. so well i appreciate you uh coming in sorry we made your dad uh wait all, so long all good all the, good thanks for having me really yeah. appreciate it it's uh so awesome being here the energy it's like palpable you know, I'm going to go back to, well, I'm going to Costa Rica after this, but I'm going to go back to Canada sad and missing this place for sure. <laughs> but I'll be back soon. We got to, we got to pressure uh, the airlines to get direct flights though. It's kind of like 14 hours for me is a little, it's a little much. It's 14 hours from Vancouver? Yeah. I've tried to get it. The quickest is maybe 12 because you have okay. to have like layover in the U.S. Yeah. for a bit, right? So. Yeah, that's a long, that's a long flight. It's a bit much, yeah. 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 Well, with all the Canadians that are moving down here, I think the, the yeah, demand keep moving is increasing. Down here. Keep so, moving down here. So, keep moving uh, down probably here. a year from now, we'll have a direct flight for you. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll let you. Uh, I know you got to get to the airport, so we'll yeah. let you get out of here. Thanks so much. All right.